All right, welcome to the July 22nd, 22nd and on credits working group meeting. Um, there's been uh, a bunch of progress on a uh, proposed scheme for unlinkabilities with ZKP using hardware-based holder keys. So I wanted to share that and get comments from um, others, um, a non-credits project. And then we we probably won't hit this third one, which is the revocation manager for Alisor, but that's, um, that's going on. But there's other questions we can ask about other statuses that are going on. So that's the plan. Um, we are recording and um, this is a Linux Foundation meeting. So the antitrust policy is in effect and a Hyperledger meeting, Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the code of conduct is in effect. Um, any other topics people want to talk about? Okay, so um, feedback from the cryptographer. So there's a bunch of interesting things that are happening and Mike, you might want to get involved. You probably should be invited to some of these meetings. Um, Hart was there at these, um, but um, so the European architecture reference framework, um, there's a GitHub issue on actually, I, I see, from this link that it's the EUDI document architect. Oh no, it's the architecture and reference framework. So that's the ARF um, for the EU digital identity project. And um, so this GitHub issue was saying, hey, this idea of using single, single use credentials to achieve unlinkability is not right. It won't work doesn't achieve unlinkability, certainly doesn't achieve um, issuer unlinkability. The issuer can check with any 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 verifier and know who the who that credential is owned by. And and so that's been the follow-up. At a couple of weeks ago, it came out that the core reason for not using anonymous credentials, I guess there's two reasons. One is that they want to use a hardware-based key. And the second is, is the cryptography is not NIST or in NASA certified. Um, so they came out, so they, at this meeting, it was stated about a month ago um, at, at the DICE conference that, no, we can do hardware-based CKPs. And so this document was published, um, which I've, I've linked in here and you can download and look at it if you haven't seen it, but it basically says, hey, we can use um, EDDS, uh, ECDSA keys for it. So I wanted to sort of summarize what that's about and and get comments and you know Mike your comments on on what this is so um, I, I shared the part the paper with you Mike um, and as I say it's now linked in the notes so if anyone wants it uh, I should put it in chat sorry I'll put the link um, for the agenda into chat and anyone can look at it but basically unlinkability with CKPs and hardware based keys so. Um, this is what I just talked about, um, with the feedback from the cryptographers, the two options that are on the table, which is use anonymous credentials or use batch issuance. Um, but the batch issue issuance pushes the complexity to the issuers and wallets and what the, um, feedback says is batch issuance is still linkable. So you don't accomplish the goal with batch issuance. You still have linkability. And so it's unacceptable to the, to the regulation. So this document, again, same document is the, so what they're saying is that they're gonna use an ECDSA pass key, um, which is the hardware key on most phones. And it's gonna, implement a zero knowledge proof that includes hardware binding, efficiency, practical deployment, and privacy. So this is what they're talking about. Um, 
the holder wants a verifiable credential. They generate an ECDSA hardware key for the credential. The issuer and holder create a secure se session similar to TLS that uses the ECDSA to secure the session. So the holder uses ECDSA and they come up with a, I guess, a shared key for securing the session. Um, the holder sends the public key with um, proof of control to the issuer. So proving that they control it. And I guess establishing the session basically does the same thing. And then the issuer generates a selective disclosure capable VC and issues it the signed VC to the holder. So there, um, the implementation that's been done so far uses MDL, which uses salted hash. SDJOTS can be used as well, but MDL is what's been used so far. The assumption is that other formats could be used that um, other than, than just MDL does not require using BBS signatures or the like. It uses ECDSA as well. So the MDL is just a stock MDL that is being issued today, and it uses ECDSA. Um, the attributes need to be encoded, and there appears to be an encoding, and there appears to be the information about how they're encoded per attribute needed. The issuer sends the signed VC to the holder. So that's issuance, which is pretty stock standard MDL issuance. So that's what they're saying is all it is is the same MDL. Um, the presentation is where it gets interesting. So they talk about using a IOP, an interactive Oracle proof. It's basically an interactive ZKP is what it is. Exactly, except, yes, um, interesting, though, when they talk about it, how many intera interactions, they say one. So it requires interactions, but evidently only one. So the verifier it's holder... Three, three steps, right? The holder okay. talks to the verifier, the verifier sends something back, and then the holder can respond. That's that's the one. Say that again? The... It's three steps. The okay. holder says... Uh, talks to the verifier, the verifier responds with something, and then the holder responds, and then you're done. Okay. So what is, do you know what the holder sends on the first part? What What's included? No, there's no details in that paper about what yeah. exactly that entails. Okay. But it's interactive, which means there has to be a request response from each side, but that's it. Okay, so similar to the CL signatures on the issuing side, where there has to be a three-step process on the on the presentation side. Now we make the presentation also require three steps. You're using BBS. You don't need that. So, but we're not. Using, you... Yes, that's the point here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm just laying it out for comparisons. Got it. Okay. For NISIC, you don't have to interact at all. Um, okay. So So that's the sequence. The holder starts to the verifier, the verifier back to the holder and the holder to the verifier, which probably means it's four steps because the verifier probably starts with a proof request. Sure. Um, okay. Do you know anything about this creates a secure session? They mentioned that a few times in the article. Think of it as like TLS. It is like TLS. There's just random data from both sides. Okay. That contributes to a session ID. That's all it means. So like okay. in TLS, for example, um, each of us are contributing uh, ephemeral keys to do yeah. a Diffie exchange. Yeah. That creates a session, right? But 
In MPC, for example, we don't use keys. Um, we just each contribute random commitments instead. And then we use that as to create a session. So like it's basically they're they're saying what no matter what way you do it, just make sure it's a secure way to create a session ID. That's all. Okay, so it could be TLS. Or at least yep. Diffie Helm. Diffie Hellman. Could be Diffie Hellman, could be even simpler than that. Okay. There's symmetric ways to do it, which are cheaper. Okay. Um, the context is needed. So the context is what the verifier sends the holder, I think, in this second step. And then the holder signs the context with the hardware key with a commitment and sends. So where what is the holder sending to the verifier in this first step? Do you know? Is that the polynomial commitment? Well, no. it's probably to help create the context. Okay. That's that's my guess is it's the random contribution. Okay. Because generally in an MPC, because interactive Oracle proof is basically MPC, just between okay. two. So you basically just say, all right, both sides will probably just contribute randomness, which gives you the context, and then the holder does the rest. Then the holder signs it, issues it this. Um, the com is the communication channel. The issuer public key is in here multiple times. The CSP is the definition of the credential schema with the attribute information. So that's kind of interesting because I don't know where that's going to come from. It sounds that's, like the schema. It's the cred, that, it's the cred def. The cred def. If you think about it, this is what exactly what the cred def is. It's the issuer's public key. It's the schema of the credential and how the attributes are encoded. BBS doesn't require that. Is that right? Uh, no, it does. You're talking about for the proof? No, but the verifier needs needs the cred def somehow. Otherwise, you can't verify the ZKP on his end. So to me, this isn't adding anything new. Well, let me. So in the BBS BCDI, they just use the context, the JSON LD context. Is that used the same way? Um, you mean to like look it all up? Yeah, like so in in the BBS BCDI work or the BCDI BBS, um, they they use um canonicalization of the JSON LD. They use RDF canonicalization to okay. get the messages to be signed. But does that also give you the the credential information? The, the, reason they're, the reason they're putting it in here is because they want to make sure that the plain text information is the same information that was signed. So right. they, they need a way okay. to map. So that's all that is. Okay. They're saying, how did you map all of these attributes just like an OnCreds V2 does? How did you map all of this to something that could be computed, you know, computed comp cryptographically. Yeah. That's all it is. I'm just trying to think of where that's going to come from and how they're going to build this. It's the same way we do it in the non crids V2. Yeah, but that's not how they do it in VCDI BBS. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Hmm. Well, some, uh, my guess is it's not that hard. It's just somehow you have to have the data before or it's signed map to something that was actually signed, right? Because I don't right. sign a picture, I sign a hash of a picture. I don't sign a date, I sign maybe the integer representation of it as a Unix right. time or something like that. So however that happens, whether it's before or after, that's all they're saying here. They want to include that as part of it. You're verifying everything. Yeah. That's all. Uh, it, 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 it may be simple from a cryptographic, but in getting it to fit into an MDL or, or those other things, that be, that's where it, 
where is that CSP stored? Who, how do, how do I as a verifier get it? Well, how uh, does the verifier know what he's verifying? Well, they in in VCDI BBS they use the JSON LD context, which does what? It still has to resolve and look things up and all of that, correct? It does via that. Hang on, sorry. You still there? Someone speak. Nope. Shoot. Hang on. Oh, it should be working again. Can you speak, somebody? I can still hear you, somebody? Yeah. Hello. Okay. There we go. I can hear you again. Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I <laughs> anyway. Um it, to me, Stephen, I, I think you're overthinking it. It's not that it's not that complicated. It's the same thing. Cryptographically, the CSP is just their way of bundling all that information together. They're just saying when you go to verify it, it should just include all of that. Now, does that matter cryptographically? Not really. They're just saying it should be part of the whole process. Okay. I'm just trying to think of how it fits with the the VCDM, like the W3. BCDM, the MDL, SD Jots, like how does that combine together? And what additional information beyond what those things give you? Like we have the luxury in an on creds, or we have had the luxury of saying, oh, here's what the schema is and here's what the cred def is. But they th those other um mechanisms don't really have that. And and that's why I wonder where it's going to come from when they try to put this into real implementation. The, the way I read it, it's just the metadata about the the proof you're verifying. Okay, that's all it is. Uh, about the proof or about what's been signed? About it's the proof. It's basically the same right? as scheme, right? How many attributes are there, and what kind of ways have they been encoded? That kind of thing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and yeah. who issued it? And that kind of, right. Uh, that's right. And how do I right. interpret the date? Is the date not only is it an integer, but it's right. the number of days since 1900, or it's a Unix timestamp, it's in seconds, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. That, that That's what it is. And it could also be when you're proving, you can say these were the ones that were hidden, these are the ones that were revealed. Right? Because it's supposed to support selective disclosure. Yeah. So all of that's got to be in there. Like, that's that's what I mean by metadata. Okay. Um, so then it then it talks about this um, execute an IOP ZKP. So this is what got me hung up, but I found this out today is that it is just a single interaction, which comes back to what you said, you know, holder to verifier, verifier to holder, and then holder to verifier to to provide that. And then, so even though it's called an interactive, it is only one extra iteration. The uh, paper leaves it as dot, dot, dot. So it wasn't, I wasn't clear whether it was, you know, one or many, but it's, it's just one. Um, it takes longer to generate than BBS because of the use of ECDSA key, but it still works more or less the same way. And and the proof exactly that, clear. <laughs> what's that? This is the part that wasn't exactly clear because they didn't go into what scheme they use to do yeah. that. Yeah. But they're basically saying that the holder is in possession of the signature, in possession of the signature that verifies under the issuer's public key and um, that any other revealed attributes are also contained in the credential. Um, these are the things not solved yet in this. Um, so there's no revocation. And what they're proposing is the use of a short-lived credentials, like one month. Um, 
So that's a that's an issue. Um, obviously, much less than ideal. Um, you have to get lots of credentials, even though you're using you can use the same one many times. You still have to get one every period for however long the validity of the of the credential is. Um, and it doesn't give you the you know anywhere close to near real time revocation capability. So that's interesting. They are claiming that other kinds of ZKPs can be supported like predicates in particular that they talk about. Um, but um, as far as I can tell, there's no implementations. It's just theoretically possible. Um, so the folks that have been working on it is um, I'm not saying would go for uh, revocation, right? And it's you know uh, proof that I that my accumulator element is in the accumulator as of a certain update number or whatever is just another one of those zero knowledge proofs that could quote theoretically be linked, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. trying to do it without pairings because there's only two types of uh, accumulators. One, one is RSA based, which they don't want, and the other one's pairing based. And they're trying to avoid those both. <laughs> Why are they avoiding them? They're trying to use only NIST approved uh, cryptography. Ah, right. Thank you. So that means. The Allosaur is valid or not valid as part of this? No. Well, I okay. mean, it works anywhere, right? It's just Allosaur is based on pairings, just like BBS okay. and Punch and there's and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that being said, I'm working with Sam on a uh, post quantum version that's lattice based, which is approved by NIST. Mm -hmm. Anyway, or, anyway, okay. I, um, I drag it. <laughs> so the whole idea is the keys would be hardware based, but there is a pile of new cryptography in here. Um, evidently, the folks at Google and 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 people they've been collaborating with, because I noticed the um, um, yeah, let me pop this one open for a second. Oh, shoot. All right. Hang on one sec. Let me. Uh... So. Um, this is the guy, Abby. I, I assume you know him, Mike, of him. Abby Shalott. Yeah. I know of him. I've never met him in person. Okay. okay. So he was, if he's they... the one demonstrating it and has been working with Google on this. Um, Lee Campbell of Google. Um, uh, Mateo was another name that came up. Um, so they're the ones, and I, I gather both um, Jan and and um, Anna are involved in the in this. So those are the names um, that were involved in this. Um, I know Hart was too. Okay. Or Montgomery was, I don't know why. I, I know I saw his name on there somewhere. Yeah, that, I mean, involved in this implementation that we're talking about. So um, evidently Google no. and these groups like Lee Campbell, I think his name is, is from Google. Abby is from Northeastern. Um, so they're the ones that have been working on it. Um, <clears throat> still requires academic formalizations, opinion on use, and a security proof. So there's a fair amount to go yet. Um, but the idea is to see if they can gather enough, use this as, as momentum to get funding to make it happen. 
Um, so thoughts, any other, is this interesting, Mike, <laughs> Mark, do you find this interesting, useful? Do you think it'll go anywhere? I mean, I think it'll go somewhere if Google's backing it. If it, if Google wasn't backing it, I'd have a hard time seeing it go anywhere. But I mean, Google's launched many projects before. So we'll have to see. Assuming it did gain some momentum, what would that mean for a non-creds one or two? Um, I, This... So certainly in the EU, the direction they're going is um, starting with batch issuance. So if we come back to the beginning here, this is the current model that's planned, which is we're, we're not going to use anonymous credentials at all. We're just going to issue you lots of credentials. You can use them one, one time each and 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 that's going to give us unlinkability the claim of the document here is that's not going to give you unlinkability it's certainly not going to give you issuer unlinkability because the issue you're you're sharing the the public key to which the credential was issued every time to every verifier even if you're only sharing it to one verifier so you're preventing correlation across verifiers but you're certainly allowing verification across um when the issuer is involved so and and they go further on that of saying this doesn't give you batch issuance doesn't give you that um the next most likely one is bbs but with the caveat that because bbs does not use any hardware key that that doesn't allow it so i don't see in the eu that going anywhere and so this suddenly gives a path for the EU to be able to use um, these key, uh, these. Um, I'm not sure what it does for a non-creds too. I mean, a non-creds V1 is what it is. <clears throat> it, mm -hmm. it exists, works, and, and can be used wherever you want. Um, I'm expecting that more more likely bbs some sort of bbs credentials is there and the and and so whether you know where what is the next version that actually gets used that's open to question because right now as i say until this came up the eu certainly was entirely ignoring it um anyone who's doing mdl is entirely ignoring anonymous credentials mm. um so it, it, it's hard to see where it goes if other than this. I mean, there's other approaches I've proposed in the past that use mostly NIST approved stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they're snarks with Merkle trees. So everything is, and then the snarks run on, um, there there's no trusted setup and they use all NIST approved signatures and curves and all of that stuff. So the only thing that wouldn't be NIST approved is the snark itself, but all it's using is basic curve operations. So anyway, that was another approach, but it, the problem with it, and this one might suffer the same fate is it was really slow on the pro on the prover side. Yeah. Yeah. So they did do a demo today that showed it on a Pixel 6, so a couple of, you know, three-year-old hardware, so that's good. And it was um, reasonable. It, it is a megabyte proof, so pretty large. <laughs> um, so that definitely is um, the two less than ideal but it wasn't ridiculously slow like it was it was 
a a reasonable user interaction. Are we talking like a few seconds, like five to ten seconds? Probably under five seconds. Okay, yeah, that's reasonable. Yeah, it was like three seconds or something. It was slightly longer. It was longer than a BBS, or sorry, than a straight MDL, but not massively longer. That's that's basically what they were were showing. But the size being a a megabyte, that's pretty big. Yeah, non creds will be a fraction of that. Yeah, and and it's it'll be under a second right now. So. Right now, in terms of performance and size, and non-creds too is sounds like it's winning. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully this one maybe becomes better, but I don't know. Yeah, there's not enough detail in that paper to really dive into and check it out. That was the problem. Yeah, it's just very high level, so it's hard to say one way or the other whether. Yeah is going to do to a non-creds or not. I mean, until then, I'm just going to keep plowing ahead with a non-creds V2. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That seems like the right thing. And we could imagine that while all of the um, the sort of foundational things don't depend on any um, pairings, it can still be integrated with additional features such as, you know, cryptographic accumulators and all, all kinds of other things with the understanding that it, it's not like, um, you know, you, you can't integrate them, right? It, it's just a, a position that the foundations don't depend on anything not NIST approved, but it is conceivable that people could optionally use features that also that they could be integrated it's not like it's a technical impossibility once you have the foundations not depending only on this things that you can't use anything else in concert with it is what i'm trying to say yeah i mean i mean a non-creds v2 is mostly a framework right you can hot swap any cryptography you want in and out of it so right now it's we've only coded ps and i'm about to push bbs but heck if we wanted to integrate this into a non-creds v2 we certainly could yeah. And that's part of what they're saying is um, whatever we do, we have to make it um, pluggable as well. I wonder how much this gets, like if we just use an on creds, how much it gets to an on creds V2, how much we already have done. That'd be an interesting question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We'll be I'm curious to see. The cool thing is you could do this and still use Allosaur for Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. So I mean not possible. we're gonna use something that's not NIST approved for revocation in the meantime, but everything else is. And then when they we finally come up with a better way to do revocation, you can always swap it out. It doesn't matter. Hmm. Revocations like like each component, the way I designed it, each primitive is supposed to be a black hole, right? Or it's a black box. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like as long as it implements the API, it doesn't care. Okay. Just all abstracted away. All right. Any other final comments on this? I'll keep people up to date as as I see and keep posting things that come through. Um, so people are aware of what's happening here. The, it was a pretty high powered meeting today. Like almost everybody that was on that, like many of the names that are on this were there. Um, so, um, was there any action items at the end of the meeting? Um, th there's a, a series of steps to see. Um, I, I don't quite know how to answer that because um, clearly there's interest in making this happen. Um, and so there is a 
um, a desire to continue forward with it and keep presenting about it and and try to accomplish the thing. So there was a to-do list at the end. There were slides presented, and as soon as I get them, I'll share them, um, which had next steps on it. It's just who is leading those next steps. I'm not quite sure. Right. Um, I think we're going to do a, there is a meeting with um, Anna coming up, I think, later this week to talk over, you know, what's more detail about what's behind it. Um, but that's sort of for a few people. Anna Lasinskia? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let me know if I can be there and I'll try okay. and come. Yeah. You also got Anya Lyman, who's on that list. Yeah. She was like uh, Jan's right hand person at when they were both at IBM, but I see she's now left IBM yeah. as well. This person seems to be the right hand person of Anna at Brown. Yeah, she's a grad student. Yeah. PhD. Yeah. This guy was there today. This guy was there today. Abby, obviously. Um, I'm not sure how many others. Abby Schultz. Have he's he's on the he's done a lot of mpc based stuff for ecdsa yeah. he's also the name for the one mpc pr protocol for ecdsa at nist okay so the protocol why is he's involved in this because this is all ecdsa <laughs> yeah well it's dkls is the name of the algorithm and he's the s shallot okay why he always spells his name lowercase, I don't know. But in every paper, he's, <laughs> his name is always lowercase, every single letter. Yeah, yeah. And on his Zoom. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, I hate to do this. This is boring, but I'll just briefly show it. And and uh, so I can say that I collected input. Um, so... Folks may or may not have heard that Hyperledger is becoming Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust, LFDT. And as, as part of that, the each project within Hyperledger becomes more or less its own entity that either remains tied to Hyperledger, is tied to LFDT, or even can be independent and can, for example, have its own GitHub organization that is uh, managed, if you will, or, or operated by, by LF. So as part of that, each one now needs a charter. And so um, there was a charter proposed, which is the Dark text is the basic charter. Um, there's a few changes in here proposed by David Boswell. So you'll see this color. And then I put in all of these changes. Um, and, and so they asked us to review them. I don't know if anyone here is interested, but would welcome your review of these. Um, the primary change that I made, these are pretty typical, but the primary change was that um, um, we have specifications and they're already under the community specification license uh, 1.0. And so I included that in it. And so that all new uh, new inbound code and specification contribution or basically any code is Apache and any specifications are community specification license 1.0. So we've already had that for a while. And so that continues to be the approach. Other than that, it's more or less the same. The um, maintainers will be whoever are the maintainers from a GitHub repository um, um, perspective. For now, so um, that's how we will start and have the first list of what is the technical steering committee will be the maintainers. So that's how that'll work. Um, as far as I know, not much changes. 
Um, and, and I don't think we'll separate out into a separate organization, but that's, I still don't understand it enough. It's all of this politics and moving foundations around. I don't know enough about, um, so if anyone knows more and has heard more, um, other than that, it, we're planning on leaving the repositories where they are, the continuing with Hyperledger or, or, or at worst transitioning to a decentralized trust if we have to change the name. So, hmm. so Hyperledger won't exist as a name? It, that's the confusing part. From what I can tell, it will still exist as a name. And so that's why I'm not quite sure whether a non-creds would remain Hyperledger and non-creds, whether it would become LFDT and non-creds or just a non-creds. I'm not sure. I know one perspective I've had on it, and that is if you say you're doing some you know, verifiable credential work and then Hyperledger immediately, everybody thinks blockchain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is why, you know, if this was, you know, if there was something other than Hyperledger a few years later, we wouldn't have been there. If, if Open Wallet probably existed or something or Diff existed before Hyperledger, we probably would be there. So, because it's it doesn't have to be blockchain. It's just it was all tied to Hyperledger Indie first, which was blockchain. Right. Yeah. Um, Victor um, Wong, who is working on the um, revocation manager for Alisor, is um, continuing to make progress on his project. So that continues. Mike, you were saying, um, have you made progress on DBS signatures? You said you were about to push a PR. Is that real? Yeah, I, I apologize. I've had pneumonia for a week. So. Oh, no. Oh. Ow. Not Get over it. So I didn't do much at all last week. <laughs> you can imagine. And our wonderful air here in Utah right now is not helping. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Okay. So. That's what I'm um, talking about right now. <laughs> any, and then last thing was any other up audits, updates on the auditing? Yeah, the audits have now finished and I need to just apply any changes that they recommended and then I can move them. Okay. So the overview meeting went well? Uh, yeah. Good. Yep. Not many findings. Excellent. Uh, bad. Nothing bad. Good. Well, nothing okay. bad. It's just when they don't find much, I'm like, did you guys really look? <laughs> or <am I> really <laughs> So it kind of gets a little frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other? For them to find? Mm -hmm. Well, I try not to make the obvious things for them to find, but yeah. <laughs> the hairy arm. Um, okay. Any other comments this week? Any other topics? Um, I got a quick question. Um, we're working at the moment on um, integrating accumulators and in particular updates of accumulators and thinking about that from the perspective of um, people above our abstraction, what do they need from our abstraction? Um, mm -hmm. So we're basically, you know, talking about, well, how do you know what, what's, I'm calling it a sequence number, how many times have we done a batch of updates to this accumulator so that I know how many updates I have to get to apply and so on. Um, and from what we've been able to find, most of the things are about the accumulators themselves and we haven't found much 
about this kind of logistics of, of how do people track and apply different updates. So we're just kind of rolling it ourselves, but wondering if there's something that is known and exists and works that we should be uh, looking at. In Alice, or we call them epochs. Epochs, yeah. And right now they're just auto incremented one, two, three, but they could also be timestamp based. They could just be the accumulator itself, which is, you know, pretty random value. I mean, it doesn't, unfortunately, there isn't really a gold standard, I would say, that exists. But if you want something that's like human readable, then a sequence number or a timestamp is probably the best way to go. Yeah, and it's we're um, deliberately not trying to fit Alisor into the same abstraction because I don't think it's going to quite fit. It's probably going to be a different one that's you know future work for us. But um, but it is different, right? In that with Alisor, you're not asking for an update to your latest witness. You're asking for a current witness. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, I was about to say that's one of the features, right? You you pass in when you, you know, what the sequence number is or epoch or whatever you call it that your last witness is from and your last witness, and then you get it updated, right? Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many are in between, how many updates, you just get the latest update. Yep. Yes. Really? You you pass or do you? I, I thought the idea was you secret share your actual element that's been signed, and you get a current yeah, witness. You never give your witness ever. <laughs> you're, you're correct. You do secret share it. Yeah. Oh, so what? It's, it's, Sorry. Sorry. What? Sorry. Say that again. You you don't pass in your witness. You pass in. Oh, you never pass your witness to the. You pass shard versions of your witness, though. No, you pass sharded versions of the element. The witness stays local. Okay. The witness so, never leaves your device, ever, once you get it. Right. And you, you get a new one next time. A new what? You get a new witness. Uh, uh, the 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 new witness is the culmination of the whole song and that secret sharing and reconstructing dance. Is you finally get an up to date witness for the for the epoch you need it for, right? Correct. Yeah, and that's all computed locally with the updates from the server. Yeah. So I just think of it as a sufficiently different form factor, if you like, or different shape from sort of uh, VB accumulators, for example, that we're not trying to abstract over it yet. It's better to leave that for future work when, once we've made more progress with, with just uh, regular VB accumulators for now. Because it'll have to be, there's different parties involved, right? So the abstraction needs to know if, there's an abstraction for Alice or it's got to know, well, there's multiple parties to send things to and there's multiple pieces of information to to track and to put back together. So it's just it's just a different shape from, for example, VB accumulators in terms of the abstraction. Mm -hmm. So do I have this right on the screen, Mike? Um... The holder passes the shards of element and the last update epoch and gets back a new witness and the epoch to which it applies. They don't get back a new witness. They get back some update data that they use to bring Ah. Alasaur basically is a VB accumulator. It's just smarter about how it updates. Okay. I'm curious, uh, the VB accumulator code, uh, 
that is in a non-creds V2 RS right now, is that some of the same code used in Allosaur? Yes, because I wrote both. Great. It's already using, it's basically doing Allosaur single server. It's not doing the MPC version. Right, okay. Okay. What we're working on is the multi-server with this intern. Which also gets you the privacy for secret shares, because the one in Al or the one in Anoncreds two doesn't do the secret sharing update. Right, the code's not even in there to do it. Right, no. But are you saying that the exact same VB code that is in Anoncreds at 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 its lowest level is the exact same code used in Allosaur? Yes. Oh, cool. They're identical. Yeah, you can look at, we made a repo in, uh, it's in Hyperledger Labs, or no, is that right? Yeah, Kernick? yeah, Hyperledger Labs, yeah. Yeah, you can look at it and you'll see it. It's all there. It's all open source, all public. Yeah, nice work. Okay, sounds good. All yep. right. We'll talk to everyone in a couple of weeks. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, See, See you, everyone. Bye.